Thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is Sarah Elger, and I'm direct. I'm the director of strategy and marketing here at Environmix, and I'm pleased to present this webinar today titled "How Plants Are Achieving Improved BioP with Biomix DC." Now, before I begin, I want to cover just a couple of housekeeping items. You are all muted, and you will be for the duration of the presentations. But if you have any questions, please just use the Q and A feature but not the chat, but the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen to send in any questions that you may have. I do hope that we have time at the end for a short question and answer period where I can answer uh, any of the questions that you submit. If we don't get to your question though, during the time that we have together, uh, we will be sure to answer each of your questions via email after the presentation. And for those of you looking for uh, certificates of completion, um, those certificates of attendance will be uh, emailed to anyone who attends this webinar live. So with that, we're going to get started. This morning, I will be sharing the latest data that we've collected regarding Biomix DC Enhanced Anaerobic Mixing System, a product which I was very honored to accept the WEF Innovation T Innovative Technology Award for on behalf of env the Environmix team in 2022. I hope that today I can convey how Biomix DC maximizes volatile fatty acid formation and, utilize, and utilization by the biomass, how Biomix DC enhances biological phosphorus removal for consistently low effluent phosphorus, how Biomix DC provides energy savings of 90% or greater, and how Biomix DC minimizes chemical addition and sludge production. The agenda for today's presentation will be, first, an introduction to enhanced biological phosphorus removal and anaerobic fermentation. Next, an overview of how Enviromix's Biomix DC Enhanced Anaerobic Mixing System works. Then I'll present data from several installations demonstrating Biomix DC's performance. Afterwards, I will provide a summary of benefits and then I'll close with a few audience questions. Now, if you've attended a webinar of mine in the past, you know that I like to get things started with some audience participation. Oh, I gotta slide this poll question over. It wasn't on the right screen. Uh, our first interactive question here is, what effluent targets for total phosphorus are you currently seeing? Please select the one answer that is most common for you. There's not a wrong answer here. Um, the options are not regulated, but you're expecting future regulations, an effluent phosphorus target of one milligram per liter or higher, an effluent phosphorus target between 0.5 and one milligram per liter, an effluent target between 0.1 and 0.5 milligram per liter, or one of the plants that are some of the plants that have really uh, low phosphorus limits of less than 0.1 milligram per liter. I'll give you just a minute. And then let's take a look at our results. Thank you for the participation. I appreciate it. Um, these are interesting results. This is somewhat what I expected. Um, it's interesting to see that we still have um, a decent number of people out there that aren't regulated. Um, but are expecting those future regulations. And then the majority um, the majority of you that responded are seeing those limits that are below one milligram per liter, which isn't, uh, isn't too surprising. So I think that uh, you'll find uh, some great benefit from this presentation today because being able to target those um, using biological phosphorus removal is going to be uh, the best and most optimum way to approach that. So let's get into our introduction to enhanced biological phosphorus removal and fermentation. We're gonna do a little bit of the science behind everything here first. The principles of enhanced biological phosphorus removal or EBPR rely on the selection and the proliferation of a specialized microbial population which take up phosphorus in excess of their normal biological growth requirements. EBPR uses sequential anaerobic and aerobic environments to provide conditions that encourage the growth of these specialized 
phosphorus accumulating organisms, or PAOs. The uptake of phosphorus occurs under aerobic conditions, but PAOs must first be conditioned by exposure to volatile fatty acids, or VFA, under anaerobic conditions. PAOs store excess phosphorus in their cell mass and phosphorus is removed with the wasted sludge. So let's dig into the details of EBPR reactions in the anaerobic selector. Under anaerobic conditions, PAOs are stressed and they use polyphosphate and glycogen stored in their cells as energy sources to enable them to uptake VFA. These VFA are converted to PHA and stored in the cells of the PAOs. As they take up VFA, the PAOs release orthophosphate into the mixed liquor. The PAO's ability to uptake food in the form of VFA give them a competitive advantage over other bacteria in the process. So now what happens when the PAOs are under aerobic conditions? Well, the PAOs, the PAOs use PHA as a source of carbon and energy for metabolism and cell growth. PAOs restore their supplies of glycogen and polyphosphate in the aerobic zone. To replenish their stored polyphosphate, PAOs will take up excess phosphate from the mixed liquor. This uptake of phosphorus is commonly referred to as luxury uptake and is dictated by the amount of VFA that's stored by PAOs and the energy and phosphorus released in the anaerobic zone. Anaerobic fermentation is a common way to boost VFA formation. EBPR success is primarily determined by influent wastewater quality and the amount of VFA that's present in proportion to the amount of phosphorus that's needed to be removed. Many plants find themselves limited with not enough VFA or carbon present in the influent wastewater. To ensure a sufficient supply of VFA for the PAO growth, VFA can be generated through the process of hydrolysis and fermentation, as shown on the image on the right. Complex organic matter, such as carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, are broken down by enzymes to create soluble organics, such as sugars and acids. Facultative bacteria then convert that sol those soluble organics to volatile fatty acids. To encourage fermentation in an anaerobic zone, it's important to maintain optimal anaerobic conditions by allowing the mixed liquor to settle and accumulate, resulting in an increased solids retention time in the zone. When I think about the most critical factors for strengthening EBPR, the items that come to mind include ensuring that the anaerobic zone maintains a low negative oxidation reduction potential, or ORP, to ensure a truly anaerobic environment. Creating a fermentation layer to facilitate the generation of VFA. Providing the optimal mixing regime to not only produce those VFA, but to also transport the VFA to the PAOs throughout the reactor. Ensuring that the surplus VFA production leads to the proliferation of PAOs, where PAOs are never VFA limited. All with an end goal of low levels of soluble, or soluble orthophosphate with minimal to no chemical precipitation required. When we get to the data portion of this webinar, we will revisit this checklist again. However, before we dive into the data, I want to make sure that you understand the unique features of Biomix DC and explain how it differs from a traditional anaerobic selector that's completely mixed and how it's even different from intermittent mixing strategies. Biomix DC enhances the anaerobic fermentation process by combining a long, deep cycle with a short mixing cycle. In the deep cycle, long periods without mixing allow solids to accumulate, creating a fermentation layer near the bottom of the anaerobic zone, producing VFA, which are transported to the PAOs through intermittent pulses of mixing without disrupting that fermentation layer. Following the deep cycle, 
compressed gas mixing quickly resuspends the solids to homogenize the sub substrate and the microorganisms. To get into a little bit more detail, during the deep cycle of Biomix DC, there are long periods without complete mixing, which causes the anaerobic zone to strat stratify with lower concentrations of biomass near the surface and higher concentrations of solids at the bottom of the zone, as illustrated with the gradient of brown in that tank image. The accumulating solids at the bottom of the zone create a sludge blanket or a fermentation layer. This fermentation layer increases the anaerobic solids retention time or SRT, resulting in the facultative heterotrophs being converted to readily biodegradable COD and volatile fatty acids. The abundance of VFA results in the proliferation of PAOs, which greatly enhances the biological phosphorus removal. While an abundance of VFA are important, it is also important that those excess VFA are accessible to the PAOs throughout the entire anaerobic reactor, not only to those that are found in the fermentation layer. Typically, as time goes by, the VFA concentration builds up in that fermentation layer. This is because all the PAOs that have access to those VFAs are fat and happy and they won't consume any additional VFA. Enviromix created a way to disperse the excess VFA by providing low intensity intermittent pulses of mixing during that deep cycle, which provide gentle turbulence in the blanket and in the entire reactor without destructing that fermentation there. These pulses transport the excess VFA found in the fermentation blanket up to where the additional PAOs can be found in the area that we call the bulk liquid, or what is the medium brown color in this image. There is no other mixing technology that can provide these gentle pulses without disrupting that fermentation layer. The result is a more consistent and a lower effluent soluble phosphorus level. Resuspending the solids or de-stratifying the anaerobic zone is important to homogenize the substrate and microorganisms. Rapid resuspension de-stratifies the selector within minutes, allowing the PAOs to continue down the process train into the aerobic zone. Complete mixing is accomplished when large compressed gas volumes expand upward and outward. These expanding bubbles provide mixing with controlled turbulence, fluid displacement, and circulatory currents. Biomix DC leverages Enviromix's core mixing technology called Biomix, which has been successfully applied in biological selector applications for nearly 15 years. Biomix utilizes 40 to 60% less energy than mechanical mixing technologies. The bottom-up mixing regime provides uniform distribution of mixing energy at a very efficient tenth of a horsepower per thousand cubic feet of anaerobic selector volume. The control system allows for adjustment of the mixing regime and the intensity based on process parameters. All in-tank components are non-clog and maintenance-free. So how does Biomix work? Biomix starts with a centralized compressor that can be used for multiple applications. The compressor, which uses ambient air, modulates to maintain system pressure while conserving energy when demand is low. Charged by the compressor, the receiver tank supplies compressed air to the valve module. This controls the mixing intensity and releases the bottled up air in high pressure, high velocity, Large volumes of gas generate an upwelling motion and create large circulatory currents, suspending solids and maintaining completely mixed environment. On the surface, you can see the convergence of these currents and the uniform distribution of energy showing that the entire volume is mixed. Before we transition to the data discussion of this presentation, I thought it would be a good time for another audience question. How strong of a correlation do you think that there is between PAO's access to excess VFA 
and consistent BIOP performance. The options are strong, moderate, weak, or perhaps you're just unsure. I'll give you a moment to answer. Okay, let's look at the results. Fantastic. I have a feeling maybe some of you have seen our webinar before or have seen some of these results uh, in your own plants when you are able to generate excess VFA. Uh, you will see it upcoming that, that in fact, uh, strong is correct. That is the right answer. All right, now on to the supporting data. Before we jump right in, I wanted to go back to our checklist and remind everyone of the list of critical factors that I shared earlier. I won't read them all through again this time, but you will see them as we continue to present the data. Each box representing a critical factor for strengthening eBPR that we will check along the way. The first critical factor for ensuring an anaerobic is ensuring an anaerobic environment with a low ORP. An anaerobic environment means that there is no free oxygen, nor any chemically bound oxygen, like nitrates. And further, when measuring the ORP or oxidation reduction potential, a truly anaerobic environment should be consistently be below around negative 200 millivolts or greater, depending on the facility. To demonstrate truly anaerobic conditions, we measured online ORP values in a number of wastewater plants with Biomix installed in their anaerobic selector. On this graph, the ORP is graphed on the y-axis over a period of time. We have gray bands here that indicate the generally acceptable bands of ORP readings for aerobic, anoxic, and anaerobic conditions. Here, I show data from four different facilities, all of which are consistently below negative 300 millivolts. So with that data, we're going to check the box that Biomix DC ensures an anaerobic zone with a low ORP. Now, we will look at generating a fermentation layer. A fermentation layer is generated when mixing is suspended for a period of time that allows for solids to settle into the tank and generate a sludge blanket. To confirm the presence of a fermentation layer, we used both a sludge judge and a handheld TSS meter and took measurements during the deep cycle when mixing was suspended. Total suspended solids data from three different plants shows a distinct stratified layers. From looking at the data on the slide, you can see that a well-defined blanket is formed in all of these plants, exceeding the upper range of the instrument that was used. These results confirm that Biomix DCs delivers a reliable fermentation blanket, and that gives us another checkbox. Next, we will examine VFA generation. Within the blanket that has formed during the deep cycle, the fermentation process will result in the production of VFA. The PAOs in the blanket begin releasing phosphorus in exchange for VFA consumption. When the PAOs have released all of their stored phosphorus, the VFA concentrations begin to increase and increase in the blanket, as you can see here by the blue colors which represent the VFA. To measure the VFA generated, samples were compared from both the fermentation blanket and the bulk liquid during the deep cycle mode of operation just prior to the start of a mixing cycle. In this box and whisker plot, the samples from the bulk layer are shown in dark blue, and the samples from the fermentation layer are shown in light blue. For those not familiar with a box and whisker plot, it's just a way to show the limits of the upper and lower quartile of the data that we collected while also being able to show the extremes. It was a great way to display all the data points that we had collected from these three different facilities. One other point of note is that the data plotted here from the Michigan plant is VFA data, whereas the Colorado and the Ohio data 
our soluble or filtered COD. We found this filtered COD test to be a little bit more easier for us to use and a little bit more reliable. So let's, let's get back to the data here. The results at these three different facilities showed substantially higher VFA and soluble COD readings in the fermentation blanket compared to the bulk liquid. In fact, the samples collected in the bulk liquid were mostly under range for the test kits that we were using, whereas the samples in the fermentation layer were all substantially higher, with many samples in the high hundreds when measuring soluble COD. The presence of high concentrations in the fermentation layer indicates an abundance or excess VFA. The excess VFA indicate a healthy anaerobic environment ripe for the first step in biological phosphorus removal. The abundance of VFA also indicates that the PAOs that are present in the fermentation layer are no longer able to take up any additional VFA. So with that, we can check the box for VFA generation and we can confirm that it is an excess in the fermentation layer, but lacking in the majority of the reactor. The next step is to examine if we can transport those excess VFA in the fermentation layer up into the bulk liquid so they can be utilized by other PAOs. As discussed, an excess of VFA building up in the bottom of the tank is not optimal as they can't be utilized fully by all the PAOs. To maximize the use of VFA by the PAOs that can be found throughout the entire tank, we want to transport those VFAs up into the bulk liquid. But the key is, is that we want to do that without disrupting the fermentation layer. The intermittent pulses of mixing during the deep cycle illustrated here by these blue arrows do exactly that. On this graph, you can see the blue lines again, which represent the time when each mixing pulse occurs. Next, we lay in the VFA measurements in the fermentation layer just prior to a mixing pulse. Finally, you can see that the second VFA measurements after a mixing pulse. The drop in VFA immediately after a pulse from the samples collected in the same spot demonstrates how the VFA are transported out of the fermentation layer and into the bulk liquid where they can be better utilized by the PAOs that are found throughout the tank. When we did this, we also wanted to confirm that when we were transferring the VFA from the fermentation layer into the bulk liquid, that we weren't disrupting the fermentation layer that had formed during that long deep cycle operation. Handheld TSS measurements before and after each intermittent pulse confirmed that the higher concentration sludge blanket at the bottom was not disrupted during a pulse. So that checks our box for VFA transport into the bulk liquid. When PAOs consume VFA, they release phosphorus. How can we see this? By comparing the influent phosphorus concentrations to the concentrations found within the anaerobic reactor. Concentrations of orthophosphate in the fermentation layer have been found to be 10 to 100 times higher than the concentrations that were found at the influent of these plants. The plant in North Carolina did some additional sampling for us and they found that the concentration of orthophosphate in the complete mixed in the in the reactor when it was completely mixed was over three times higher than what the average influent concentration was, demonstrating the release of phosphorus from the PAOs. Subsequent phosphorus uptake in the aerobic zones in excess of what was previously released completes the BioP process. The data shows that Biomix DEC delivers reliable phosphorus release. Another check. So now in order for me to present some DNA analysis that supports the proliferation of PAOs, I need to just take a moment and get into a little bit of detail for the plant in Michigan. This image shows an overhead shot of the facility. The treatment process consists of two separate sludge streams with two independent activated sludge systems. The west side of the plant is an AO plug flow design with three passes. The east side has an anaerobic zone up front, just like the west, but then it flows into a completely mixed reactor. The east and the west sides of the plant have separate secondary clarifiers and therefore completely independent sludge streams. This makes it an ideal candidate for comparing PAO populations using the DNA analysis. 
One DNA sample was collected from both the east and the west side of the plant, each from the aerobic zones. Both samples were analyzed for PAO species, and the results are shown here as a percent relative abundance in the sample. The DNA sample from the west side of the plant showed over 12% PAO relative abundance, whereas the east side showed just about 4%. For both samples, the dominant organism present is Dichloromonas, which based on our research is an important PAO, along with the more commonly recognized Accumulobacter and Tetrasphera. Dichloromonas are often abundant in full-scale EBPR plants and may also be important for nitrogen removal specifically denitrification. So with this, we are able to check off the fact that our unique Biomix DC operation is, in, is resulting in a proliferation of PAOs. Finally, we get to the results that matter most to any treatment facility. How does all of this affect my effluent quality? On this slide, we see two trend lines. The top line in orange is showing the influent total phosphorus entering the anaerobic zone including that from the primary clarifier effluent, the RAS and the side stream processes. The bottom line in blue is showing the effluent orthophosphorus. The black dotted line on the graph illustrates the date in which we started operation of Biomix DC. There are two main things that I would like to point out regarding the performance. First, the removal efficiency. Based on the influent and effluent data that we have collected from the plant, the average removal efficiency before implementation of Biomix DC was only around 85%. And often, this plant found themselves needing to dose ferric chloride to precipitate phosphorus for days at a time in order to meet their one milligram per liter permit. After using Biomix DC, the average removal efficiency quickly jumped to an average of 95%. And that's not all. Despite the continued fluctuations in the influent phosphorus shown on the top orange plant trend, the effluent phosphorus remains consistently low. Similar data was collected from a North Carolina plant. Prior to implementation of Biomix DC, the effluent phosphorus fluctuated wildly from week to week as, she, as seen in the orange influent line. After implement, or I'm sorry, as shown in the, the blue line on the bottom, the effluent. After implementation, the performance stabilized, resulting in a more consistent effluent quality. So with that, we check off another box. Biomix DC delivers effective and efficient phosphorus removal. There's also substantial savings for plants that need to supplement BioP with either carbon addition and or chemical dosing for precipitation, specifically for plants that have low influent BOD to P ratios or low influent BFA. The plant in Michigan was able to drastically reduce their chemical addition after implementing Biomix DC. The plant only doses chemical when ortho readings in the aeration tank start creeping up closer to their limit. The more stable effluent quality resulted in a 73% reduction in ferric chloride consumption compared to the prior year. It's important to note that the financial savings of chemical reduction is just one piece. Reduction in chemical use for precipitation directly results in reduction of sludge volumes and subsequently reduction of sludge disposal costs. So with that, our final box is checked, lower chemical usage. Now that we have reviewed the testing data and checked the boxes for the most important factors that contribute to eBPR, I would like to review how Biomix DC can benefit you. One of the most obvious benefits that can oftentimes be overlooked is the energy savings that can be found with Biomix DC. There is a substantial savings that are realized during the deep cycle phase of the process because mixing is nearly always off, less the intermittent pulses. That savings, combined with Biomix using 40 to 60% less than conventional mixing technologies, will result in a net energy savings of 90% or greater. The Michigan facility compared energy costs from 2020 when they utilized Biomix to completely mix their anaerobic reactors to 2021 when they utilized Biomix DC and saw an 89% reduction. Similar energy costs to the 2021 data have been noted in the years since this evaluation. 
Biomex DC provides unparalleled flexibility to meet the needs of plants of any configuration or size. Biomex DC is compatible with any and all other biomix systems that may be on site, whether that be in anoxic zones, swing zones, or post-anoxin zones within the secondary treatment process, or any location in the plant that requires mixing. The applications shown here illustrate the many of the opportunities for biomix in a wastewater facility. All of these applications can be mixed with a single source of compressed air, which means a single maintenance point and one that is always located in a controlled environment. Biomix DC demonstrates flexibility and compatibility with regard to how it can be used in many different fermentation configurations. The first that I'll show you is inline fermentation, where the primary effluent and the RAS enter an anaerobic tank that is operated as a fermentate, fermentation tank. This is the configuration that we saw in our Michigan example earlier. This option is perfect for retrofitting an existing anaerobic zone or repurposing excess aerobic volume at plants that don't have any additional tanks or room for newly constructed tanks. Biomix DC is installed in the anaerobic tank in this configuration, and Biomix is used in the anoxic tank where it provides a consistent mix mixing. Another configuration that plants may elect to use is side stream RAS fermentation. In side stream RAS fermentation, an auxiliary tank is needed to feed a slipstream of the return activated sludge or RAS for fermentation. The side stream reactor utilizes the return activated sludge as the substrate for hydrolysis and fermentation to produce those VFAs, which are then fed to the mainstream anaerobic zones. The hydraulic retention time in a side stream RAS fermentation tank may be between 12 and 48 hours. In this example, Biomix DC is installed in the RAS fermentation tank and in the anaerobic tank, and Biomix is used in the anoxic tank as before. Another configuration that plants may elect to use is side stream mixed liquor fermentation. In side stream MLSS fermentation, again, an auxiliary tank is needed. This time, a slipstream of the mixed liquor in the anaerobic zone is sent to the MLSS fermentation tank. This is often used when the plant's existing anaerobic zones need more volume in order to generate VFAs. Some say that side stream MLSS ferments at a higher fraction of soluble organics. For Biomix DC, it doesn't matter which of these configurations the plants determines is best for their process. Biomix DC works in all of these configurations and performs better than a traditional approach of just suspending mixing for long periods of time. Why is that? Because as we have shown, Biomix DC checks all of the boxes needed to strengthen eBPR, including the very important objective of transporting excess VFA to PAOs that are waiting to take them up. In summary, Biomix DC ensures an anaerobic zone with low ORP is present, creates a fermentation layer at the bottom of the tank during the long deep cycle, generates VFA in the fermentation layer, transports those VFAs to the PAOs that are present throughout the bulk liquid, resulting in proliferation of PAOs in the mixed liquor, and ultimately consistently lower effluent phosphorus and lower chemical usage. Thank you all so much for your participation and your interest in our presentation today. My contact information is shown on the screen if you would like to contact me directly. There's also a QR code that you can use to sign up for email updates from Enviromix. A follow-up email will be sent to all participants with a certificate of completion and additional information about both Biomix DC and Biomix. When you exit out of this webinar, please take a moment to complete the short survey to provide us and me feedback about whether about how you thought this presentation went and specifically if you would like to, someone to contact you about any of our Enviromix products. Thank you again so much for your time. Now I'll wrap things up by answering a few of the questions that you submitted through the Q&A feature. And remember, if I don't get to your specific question, don't worry, someone from Enviromix will follow up with you via email. Just gonna take one sip of water before I answer questions.
So one of the questions that I have here, we have a number of them. Thanks for all of your engagement. Um, this is exciting. Uh, what I have here is how long is the deep cycle operated? Um, the deep cycle can be operated uh, anywhere from eight, uh, 10, 12, 24 hours long. Um, and then the mixing cycle uh, typically uh, is fairly quick to resuspend the solids anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes for the mixing cycle. And those parameters on how we set them and how long those are, are based on the operating data that we collect from the specific plants. So depending on how the fermentation process is going and how the release is going, um, we might shorten or elongate those different um, operation periods. Uh, there's another question about a typical settling period to form the fermentation layer. Um, that typical settling period We've seen, uh, it depends obviously on the plant, it depends on the mixed liquor concentration, but usually within, uh, I would say anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, we can see that fermentation layer develop um, and then it stays there for that whole period of time while we're in that deep cycle operation. Um, what equipment or method was used for VFA testing? Uh, what we did with that is, we had done VFA testing, like I said, at the Michigan facility. What we found there was that um, the Hawk VFA test kits uh, was what we used. Sorry, that's the answer to the question is um, Hawk VFA test kits. Um, but we found that those were a little bit unreliable. And so at the next facilities and, and as we continue to sample at uh, new facilities here, uh, we've been using uh, filtered COD tests. So we're using just the Hawk uh, test kits for COD. Uh, test tubes for COD, and then it's just a filtered sample with uh, 0.45 micron filter paper. <clears throat> um, I have a question here. Uh, generally, U.S. wastewater treatment plants have most, the majority of wastewater treatment plants in the U.S. are less than 5 MGD. Um, do we see that general breakdown um, for plants? Um, Sure. Yes. I mean, you know, when you look at like just sheer number of plants uh, that you're looking at, um, there's there's obviously a lot more opportunities at smaller wastewater treatment plants. But the facility in Michigan that we were just talking about, I believe that they are, I forget if they're permitted for 25 or 50 MGD. Um, they're operating a little bit lower than that, um, obviously, as most plants are. But we have seen um, and we're also have it installed at another facility that's a much larger facility, closer to 50 MGD. Um, so we do see a lot of the larger wastewater treatment plants using that as well. Um, I have another question about size of facility. This is um, what's the low end? This is about biomix. Is biomix applicable? What's the low end that biomix is applicable, which you have installed equipment? Um, it says tank size and flow. And so I guess to answer that question, um, as far as biomix is concerned, biomix can be installed almost in any type of tank um, at uh, of, of any size, of any kind of configuration, any kind of floor bottom, slope floor, flat floor. Um, and so I would think if I looked in our database that I would see results from anywhere down to a plant as small as, you know, maybe 0.1 or 0.2 MGD. Um, I know we definitely have a couple installations that are up in more of the 100 MGD uh, range. Um, but as far as like a tank, you know, we've installed a single nozzle in, um, a, you know, a tank that's part of a system if it's part of a bigger system. Um, you know, we can, some smaller zones uh, might require just only a single nozzle. And then we've had tanks that are so large that, you know, they've got hundreds, um, if not maybe up to a, a thousand nozzles uh, spread throughout the reactor in order to completely mix. Um, that was a really big tank, that one. Um, let me see here. I will answer a couple more questions. And then I do want to make sure that um, we end on time so you guys have Time to go about your day. Um, there's a question about how many of the plants have uh, primary clarifiers. Um, the Warren facility had primary clarifiers. The North Carolina facility, yep, they had primary clarifiers as well. They were actually um, an equalized plant as well. So they equalized their flow before they brought it in. 
And then the Ohio facility. Uh, you know what? That's a good question. I don't remember one off the top of my head. I think they had primary clarifiers, but they might not have. Um, I'd have to look back into that and I can get you the answer on that one. Uh, let me look here. Um... I see a couple of questions that I think I've already answered. Um, there's a question here about BOD to P ratios for each of these plants. Um, the Warren facility, I recall, was very low. They they knew they struggled with VFAs. That's why they uh, they were actually our flagship installation. Um, we had installed Biomix in their system back, I think it was either 2014 or 2016. And when we were developing this new product, uh, I don't know, back in 2020, uh, they were one of the first plants that we contacted just because we had had a relationship with them and we knew that they were struggling with that. And they definitely raised their hand and um, said that they were really struggling um, with VFAs and specifically low carbon ratios into the plant. All these plants, um, had a lower concentrate they definitely didn't have an abundance of carbon or an abundance of vfa um which is why they needed that fermentation and why that fermentation um resulted in better quality effluent uh phosphorus concentration so i would say all of them were um below that 30 ratio and probably more of them were closer to that 20 20 to 1 ratio Um, so with that, I think I'm going to wrap up. I definitely see some other questions on here, but, um, I want to make sure that I get you the detailed answers that you're looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, we will work on providing written responses to you. Um, as you close out, uh, don't forget to take that survey. I think it's maybe 10 questions, uh, really short and quick. Provide us some more feedback. Let us know what other webinars you're interested in and what other topics we could cover. Um, we welcome your feedback and I thank you for your time and your attention and all of your engagement today. Have a wonderful day.